Here, the sentence will be respected. I will compose each sentence with care by minding what the rules of writing dictate. For example, all sentences will begin with capital letters. Likewise, the history of the sentence will be honored by ending each one with appropriate punctuation, such as a period or question mark, thus beginning the idea, thus bringing the idea to momentary completion. You may like to know, I do not consider this a creative piece. I do not regard this a poem of great imagination or work of fiction. Also, historical events will not be dramatized for an interesting read. Therefore, I must respect. Therefore, I feel most responsible to the orderly sentence, conveyor of thought. That said, I will begin. You may or may not have heard about the Dakota 38. If this is the first time you've heard of it, you might wonder, what is the Dakota 38? The Dakota 38 refers to 38 Dakota men who were executed by hanging under orders from President Abraham Lincoln. To date, this is the largest legal mass execution in U.S. history. The hanging took place on December 26, 1862, the day after Christmas. This was the same week that President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. In the preceding sentence, I italicized same week for emphasis. There was a movie titled Lincoln about the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. The signing of the Emancipation Proclamation was included in the film Lincoln. The hanging of the Dakota 38 was not. In any case, you might be asking, why were 38 Dakota men hung? As a side note, the past tense of hang is hung, but when referring to the capital punishment of hanging, the correct past tense is hanged. So it's possible that you're asking, why were 38 Dakota men hanged? They were hanged for the Sioux Uprising. I want to tell you about the Sioux Uprising but I don't know where to begin. I may jump around and details will not unfold in chronological order. Keep in mind, I am not a historian. So I will recount facts as best as I can, given limited resources and understanding. Before Minnesota was a state, the Minnesota region, generally speaking, was the traditional homeland for Dakota Ainsinaabe and Ho-Chunk people. During the 1800s, when the U.S. expanded territory, they purchased land from Dakota people as well as other tribes. But another way to understand that sort of purchase is Dakota leaders ceded land to the U.S. government in exchange for money or goods, but most importantly, the safety of their people. Some say that Dakota leaders did not understand the terms they were entering, or they never would have agreed. Even others call the entire negotiation trickery. But to make whatever it was official and binding, the U.S. government drew up an initial treaty. This treaty was later replaced by another, more convenient treaty, and then another. I've had difficulty unraveling the terms of these treaties, given the legal speak and congressional language. As treaties were arbogated, broken, and new treaties were crafted, one after another, the new treaties often referred, often referenced old defunct treaties, and it is a muddy switchback trail to follow. Although I often feel lost on this trail, I know I am not alone. However, 
as best as I can put the facts together. In 1851, Dakota Territory was contained to a 12 mile by 150 mile long strip along the Minnesota River. But just seven years later, in 1858, the northern portion was ceded, taken, and the southern portion was conveniently allotted, which reduced Dakota land to a stark 10 mile tract. These amended and broken treaties are often referred to as the Minnesota treaties. The word Minnesota comes from min, which means water, and sota, which means turbid. Synonyms for turbid include muddy, unclear, cloudy, confused, and smoky. Everything is in the language we use. For example, a treaty is essentially a contract between two sovereign nations. The U.S. treaties with the Dakota Nation were legal contracts that promised money. It could be said this money was payment for land the Dakota receded, for living within assigned boundaries, a reservation, and for relinquishing rights to their vast hunting territory, which in turn made Dakota people dependent on other means to survive. Money. The previous sentence is circular, akin to so many aspects of history. As you may have guessed by now, the money promised in the turbid treaties did not make it into the hands of the Dakota people. In addition, local government trades could not, would not offer credit to Indians to purchase food or goods. Without money, store credit, or rights to hunt beyond their 10 mile tract of land, Dakota people began to starve. The Dakota people were starving. The Dakota people starved. In the preceding sentence, the word starved does not need italics for emphasis. One should read the Dakota people starved as a straightforward and plainly stated fact. As a result, and without other options but to continue to starve, Dakota people retaliated. Dakota warriors organized, struck out, and killed settlers and traders. This revolt is called the Sioux Uprising. Eventually, the U.S. Cavalry came to Minnesota to confront the uprising. More than 1,000 Dakota people were sent to prison. As already mentioned, 38 Dakota men were subsequently hanged. After the hanging, those 1,000 Dakota prisoners were released. However, as further consequence, what remained of Dakota territory in Minnesota was dissolved, stolen. The Dakota people had no land to return to. This means they were exiled. Homeless, the Dakota people of Minnesota were relocated, forced onto reservations in South Dakota and Nebraska. Now, every year, a group called the Dakota 38 plus two riders conduct a memorial horse ride from Lower Rural, South Dakota to Mankato, Minnesota. The memorial riders travel 325 miles on horseback for 18 days, sometimes through sub-zero blizzards. They conclude their journey on December 26, the day of the hanging. Memorials help focus our memory on particular people or events. Often memorials come in the form of plaques, statues, or gravestones. The memorial for the Dakota 38 is not an object inscribed with words but an act. Yet I started this piece because I was interested in writing about grasses. So there is one other event to include, although it's not in chronological order and we must backtrack a little. When the Dakota people were starving, as you may remember, government traders would not extend store credit to Indians. 
One trader named Andrew Myrick is famous for his refusal to provide credit to Dakota people by saying, if they are hungry, let them eat grass. There are variations of Myrick's words, but there are all something to that effect. When settlers and traders were killed during the Sioux uprising, one of the first to be executed by the Dakota was Andrew Myrick. When Myrick's body was found, his mouth was stuffed with grass. I am inclined to call this act by the Dakota warriors a poem. There is irony in their poem. There was no text. Real poems do not really require words. I have italicized the previous sentence to indicate inner dialogue, a revealing moment. But on second thought, the words, let them eat grass, click the gears of the poem into place. So we could also say language and word choice are crucial to the poem's work. Things are circling back again. Sometimes when in a circle, if I wish to exit, I must leap and let the body swing from the platform out to the grasses. <laughs>